John Dean Nature House presents Jay Wasn't Alone, written by Jarrett Teague, read by Peter Walters, for the stories of John Dean. Friday, March the 26th, 1943. John Dean, age 92, had dozed off. Now he awoke and looked up at the nurse who stood beside his bed with the cranberry juice he'd asked for. You've been away, Mr. Dean, she said gently. Yes, sister, he affirmed. I have. I've been preparing my soul. She gave an answering smile, but made no reply until he'd grasped the dark, salty chocolate she knew was his favourite. Have you been thinking of things that happened long ago? Yes, things I've experienced over my lifetime, he replied. A soft smile hovered around his lips, now moist with the juice. The edges of his eyes had also grown moist as nostalgia crept in. I was back in the house where I was born, he said. I was a little boy again, and do you know, sister, I heard Anish's voice again, just as plainly as I hear you. He gave me a sense of my destiny, you know. Who was Anish, Mr. Dean? Uh, an old friend, he said, conscious of the fact that the man in question was standing on the other side of the bed, grinning. This spirit and John had interacted with deep friendship since John had been a boy of five, but he couldn't possibly speak to this highly professional lady of someone she would probably regard as, at best, a figment of his imagination. Not that it mattered in any case. She had her job to do, and seeing that he was all right, she left him to take care of things. John refocused on the figure that had been with him for some time now. Do you think she would have understood if I'd told her about you? Nay, lad, Anish laughed. You know, my boy, there are none so blind as those who will not see. Anish gave his familiar wink, and they chuckled. Aye, said John, grinning up at his visitor and using the same familiar Cheshire twang. But she's a good woman in her own way. Aye, but on her path she's no physical involvements, unlike yourself, as you found when you got together with Vienna. John blushed. Now listen, my boy, you know there are no secrets between us, so stop that embarrassment nonsense. The two of you loved each other, as well you know, so hush up. He looked at Anish with the deep fondness of friendship, such a relief to have someone who knew, and who, although his home was in the next world, knew and liked him very much. John smiled at that memory. It was one of those comforts he carried throughout his life. He drifted off again. Come to bed, dear. You can finish those in the morning. The lady smiled softly, put down the sock she had been darning, and slipped into bed beside the man. He blew out the candles, then turned towards her. Mary Ann. Tonight, William? Oh, yes. This was a very special night. For the first time in ages, William was able to forget about the chores, responsibilities, and the nor'easter that was beginning to sigh across the farm. What was the cause of such forgetfulness was, of course, togetherness. That was how, at 10.02 p.m. on March the 19th, 1850, John Dean was conceived in his parents' ancient farmhouse, Sheepcroft, built in 1733, near Stretton in Cheshire. John wasn't there in anything but potentiality, but Anish had shown the scene to him while in that magical state, somewhere between waking and sleeping, in his bed in St. Paul's Hospital, confirming as nothing else could what he needed to know about his entry into this world 
As the scene began to fade, he returned to the deep sleep that he needed. Once again, the scene shifted. John was a little boy. He loved the old house where he was born, feeling that it was his own. But this feeling of belonging had not yet shaped his personality. One night, when he was five, he was walking towards his room along one of the familiar passages. Suddenly, a beautiful, deep voice, one he had never heard before, spoke to him from above the doorframe leading out of the next room. He stopped. Hello, little boy. How are you? John went tingly all over. Somehow he managed to get a reply out. Fine, thank you, sir. That's well, lad. You're not afraid of me, then, even though you can't see me. No, sir. Please, you're good. I trust you. That right, lad. Now, listen to me. When you get older, lad, you will travel this old world wide over, and you'll do good to many people, and they won't be able to make a fool of you. Do you hear that? Yes. Good. Now, remember, lad, my name is Anish, and from time to time I'll look in on you, and I'll show you things that will help you, but only as long as you'll help others. Understand? Yes, sir. When will you be back? I'll come to you whenever I think you need me. Till then, lad, be good to your parents, help them raise the rest of the family. Years later, he realized that what he had received during that first of many visitations was the awakening of himself as a unique individual and the strong sense of destiny he was to carry throughout his life. That guidance would carry him unfailingly through the years, would develop in him a sense of where to put his feet and give him as sure a guide as he would need to accomplish the things he had to do. It was an early morning in December of 1872. He felt restless. It occurred to him that it was St. Nicholas's Day, and he took the story of the gift-giving saint as a sign that all would be well. The rest of the family was still asleep. He was making coffee in the kitchen of the old farmhouse when Anish appeared, and he knew why he felt so restless. It's time, lad. Now, are you sure this is my path? Yes, it's your destiny, your travels, and your life onwards. They are about to begin. But I'll have to leave Susan. Yes, lad, she has her own path to follow. Hi, you'll miss each other for a while, but there will be many new friends. But none of them will be like Susan. No, lad, they won't. No friend can replace the friends we make when we're young. This path has been waiting for you for a very long time, so take the leap of faith and make a new beginning. That was when John Dean, age twenty-two, decided to go to America. North America Seventy years after his arrival, he felt full of the excitement that the magical name had awakened in him, a land of such opportunity that, from Europe towards the New World, snap, the memory hit him with such force that he nearly lost track of it, an ocean journey on board a steamer in the middle of winter is not the best thing to remember when lying sick in a hospital bed, yet the astonishment soon faded and the strength of the memory resurfaced. He was once again aboard the Allen Lines steamer, and was far from enjoying the experience. I'm not happy, and to be on the North Atlantic during a storm has never been praised by anyone. In that early January of 1873, when John set out from Liverpool, sailing ships were still within living memory. After passing Northern Ireland, they encountered their first severe weather, 
The vessel rolled and pitched agonizingly, wind and waves. Every so often the whole ship shuddered as if she was trying to slam herself apart. In between episodes of seasickness, John thought nostalgically about the traditional sailing ships. They might, he opined, be a slightly better way of tackling the North Atlantic in a winter storm, because they didn't have propellers. Similar to anyone who has been seasick, he was half afraid he would die, and half afraid that he wouldn't. He was clammily cold, despite the blankets he'd been given. The Leander Nevian, one of the Allen Line's best, did what they could to give their frail occupants some comfort in the teeth of what John felt was a nightmare. Oh, my, he thought, as yet another ship-wide shudder went through him. I think I've heaved up every meal I've ever eaten. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? Anish's words from a month before became the only sustenance he could keep down. Just as he was needed, manifesting himself, as he usually did, Anish said, Have a little of that brandy your grandmother gave you, and eat some of that orange. If there's nothing in thy tummy to bring up, that even can do you some real harm. John did, and immediately felt better. And when, a few minutes later, he bit into some of the other solid food he'd brought with him, he felt as if he wasn't going to die young after all, and the scene shifted again. With new friends on board a railway coach, the sheer size of the new world began to impinge on his consciousness, and hours of the journey still remained. They had landed in Halifax shortly after three that morning. Finally, they'd been taken from the freezing boat sheds and the plain customs house across to the train that was to take them to Montreal. Once the sun had risen, most of the trip proved to be excruciatingly dull. He'd never seen so much snow-covered bush that seemed so identical and so endless. But despite the constant clicking and rumbling of the coach, it was fine compared to the heaving he'd known aboard the ship. Finally, exhaustion took over, and he managed to catch a couple of hours' sleep. Then came Montreal. New buildings had just been completed, and John looked at the architecture around him with an appreciative satisfaction that quickly replaced his doubts. He'd seen other cities from time to time, but Montreal was by far the most alive city he'd ever been in. He was astounded by the amount of activity in this place. Indeed, the city never seemed to sleep. It was an amazing introduction to the new world, surveying the city nightlife, men and women. He continued to Toronto, then north to Aurelia, to stay with family. He loved the winter atmosphere surrounding Lake Kuchiching. Months later, John relocated to Toronto, and being a keen observer of the human condition, surmised accurately. Aye, lad, John turned, his eyes connected with Anish's, and they both giggled. The scene faded in laughter. Eight years old. You knew, and you never said anything. How could you? How could you? Anish looked at John. Lad, there's nothing I could have said that you would have heard, he said kindly. Your mother has done her work. She's finished her course in your world. You have to know that she's over here now. I won't be the one that'll look after her, but because of you, we did have a word in passing. She'll be starting some new adventures, and she will have the very best of friends to guide her and those include the man who was your father. So even though what you have been through has left you devastated, think of how you will be flourishing over here. Now, I know you're young, but you must begin to prepare for your work in this world. In time, you will travel widely, but before that 
you have certain skills to learn that will stand you in good stead. In those travels, you'll do a lot more good than you will ever imagine yourself capable of. John turned his tear-stained face towards Anish. But why my mum? Aye, lad, the eternal question. Very few can see the answer. Sometimes you may have an answer. All I can say now is that whenever it is that you are called from your world into mine, you leave when you must. There's no going back. John burst into a fresh bout of tears at the mention of the lady who had been buried that afternoon. Anish waited until the storm subsided and then said, You're hurting now, lad, I know. I've been there myself, many times. You'll survive, and not just survive, you'll thrive. These wounds you've sustained will allow you to understand the pain of others, and you'll be better able to help them. That's one of the things you'll be called upon to do many times down the road. Go now and comfort your sister Sarah and brother George. They need you. And Anish disappeared. Yes, that was amazing. The two of them lay snuggled in bed in the cold pre-dawn, sharing mutual warmth. She looked over to reaffirm her feelings. Work had to be done, but more importantly at that moment, gently and in silence, she slipped out of bed. Beautiful, kind, almost like, John thought, but not the same. Nay, lad, no love is like any other. John nearly jumped out of his skin as Anish suddenly made himself visible. I wish you wouldn't do that. Anish laughed, and the chuckle cut right through John's embarrassment. Now, lad, you may think she's a friend, and in a way she is, but in her mind everyone should know her, because she thinks that she is the centre of the universe, having no real understanding of friendship of any sort. And your other friend, he hasn't a clue as to how the world ticks, nor does he understand basic money. What does that mean? It means, lad, that you may as well forget about the money you've loaned him. He regards this as a gift, because, from his viewpoint, he's graciously allowed you to know him for however short a time. He doesn't have conscience to pay you back. A dash of cold water. What? But he said... Oh, I see. But that means I haven't the rent, and... There's... Uh-oh. This was serious indeed. The boarding-house lady proved to be firm when it came to the amount, fifteen dollars, that John owed. She took out her affronted feelings on those she felt would cheat her, and this she mistook for strength. The upshot was that he had to abandon his tools and belongings at the boarding-house he'd been locked out of, while he desperately looked for a job. Thankfully, he found one, building for the city, and was paid for that work at day's end. He retrieved his belongings and paid the rest the following week, but the experience soured him on trusting friends. Philadelphia and New York, he thought, might be more to his liking. And it was, after all, only a night's travel by train from Toronto. Crossing into the United States was easy. The borders were then, as still are, relatively easy to access compared to those between other nations. Yet even with that, he felt as if he'd been warmly welcomed and not treated as just another traveller. I'm witnessing history. Here I am, a young Englishman, thousands of miles from home, in a crowd actually looking at the winner of the American Civil War, who is now the President of these United States. For the first time, he knew he was being carried forward by a wave of destiny, a wave over which he knew 
he had some control, and about which he knew nothing. Yet, due both to what he had learned and what Anish had shown him, fear of the unknown wasn't an issue. He knew there was some sort of prevailing protection over him. Suddenly, that protection became a vital necessity. John had taken an unfamiliar weapon in his hand, and his deeply buried dislike of the thing was intensified by a sudden explosion. The bullet ricocheted off a rock, sending everyone to the ground. Well, not bad for a fast time, drawled a nearby cowboy. John knew instinctively that the draw was put on for his benefit. The man took back the gun, and in a series of moves that John instinctively knew were very genuine, emptied the chambers in three extremely accurate shots at a nearby target. John was amazed. So, how long have you been doing this? The man grinned and then admitted he'd been at it since he was a boy. But you are an old, he added, and if you keep at it, you might be able to do this in, say, a year or so. Laughing followed his remark. The day was not yet over. John decided to show them that, as an English farm boy, he could at least ride a horse. But the animal he chose was not the sort to be found on British farms. This was a mustang, the semi-wild breed for which the West was already becoming known. And as John took the reins, the horse took over. Sensing not only a total stranger on his back, but one who didn't know much about horses, wild or otherwise, the animal took off, racing for as long as he took to gain some momentum, then suddenly brought himself to a dead halt. John, not expecting this, flew over the horse's suddenly bowed head, hit the ground and lay stunned but only for as long as to quickly regain his wits. He got up and eyed the horse with what he called courage, and again climbed up and on. Again the horse tried to unseat him, but this time John was ready. He knew a few techniques of his own and used them. The horse took longer to heave him off, and when he was pitched a second time he landed better. But enough is enough. John said to himself, and he knew that the horse was beginning to respect him. So did the crowd who cheered as he picked himself up and hobbled towards home. Remember, said Anish, when a believing person prays, great things happen. The image of a gun-slinging lawman deeply attracted his romantic side, but the flagrant disregard of the law put the brakes on carrying that very far. He was gradually growing more comfortable with living in the southern states, building his first home, working and exploring the country. But this was Texas in the latter half of the nineteenth century. Compared with what he had seen of America till then, it seemed like a different country altogether, as he was a man raised within the pale of British law and the respect it engendered. Faint warning flags began to wave at the back of his mind. He ignored those signals for five years, which was about as long as he could, because he had completed his projects and time was permitting. He decided to return to his native England, so John Dean turned his sights east and north and arrived back home shortly before Christmas of 1882. However, a short time visiting with family, touring museums, sightseeing through cities and estates was enough. John had grown used to the relatively free and easy informality of America, and he felt that he had allowed homesickness in its most shrewd and deceptive form to overcome him. The social restrictions that his birthplace laid upon him made him realize as nothing else could that the England he had left behind, and which had blossomed in his imagination, was no longer his home. That was when he decided to return to the nearest British soil in North America, but not to Texas. His vision was strong, and it took him to America's capital, 
Washington, D.C. There he worked, explored all over, observed the construction of the Washington Monument, and continued his studies with Freemasonry. Well accomplished and ready, his vision was even stronger now, and it took him to Canada's west coast. The Canadian Pacific Railway was still, for the most part, in the planning stage, and the Panama Canal was but a dream. So, such a trip could mean a sea journey of up to two months, and he would certainly include the Straits of Magellan. However, a transcontinental rail line had by then been laid across the states, so he decided to go via San Francisco. For adventure to happen, John felt that this was the place to be. He walked up one steep hill and down the next, and like most visitors to San Francisco, he was rapidly falling in love with the place. The gingerbread homes were, at this time, just beginning to be built, with the keen eye of a builder, John observed the breathtaking imagination of the designers. After the winter drabness of his England birthplace, the throb of life in Toronto and the wildness of Texas, here was a place of difference again. As Anish had promised him, he was going to see the world. And he loved it all. This time, his deep longing for quality homes that had been built with flair was satisfied, and that was coupled with one of the finest climates America had to offer. But the British way of life called. A new colony, a new capital city, loyally named after the Lady Queen Victoria, then at the height of her reign, called him with an imperative voice. He drifted toward Another imperative voice. He was back in the hospital, and it was March of 1943. Sister Mary was bringing him his medicine and telling him, not asking him, to take it, and take it now. She was in no mood for chit-chat since a letter that made it across the wartime borders had reached her, bringing her, in a way, news of her relatives in Berlin. She was deeply worried about them, since she knew they were among the few brave enough to defy the majority. The thoughts of what they could suffer filled her with deep fear. "'Give us some words of support, my boy,' said Anish, as he quickly explained what the root of her off-handed manner was. "'From where I stand, I see that her relatives will have a very dicey time for a while, but they will in the end come to no great harm. But she, of course, cannot see or know that, he added. John passed on Anish's message. It greatly surprised and comforted the nun, since she hadn't mentioned to anyone why she was upset. His words visibly relieved her. She couldn't know the source of John's certainty, but her heart felt that he was right, and, after his passing, she would remember and cherish his comforting words for the rest of her life. By age sixty, John had developed enough wealth to be comfortable. The sale of buildings and properties, water rights plus gold and cash savings, with insurance income, all ensured freedom. As Anish had encouraged, he wanted to see the world and its peoples, the advent of the new century, coupled with Sir Wilfrid Laurier's dictum that the twentieth century belongs to Canada, gave him the only excuse he needed to do just that. With amazement he recalled his 1913 trip to San Francisco, Hawaii and New Zealand, the magical island of Tasmania and Australia. Since his home was in British Columbia, he couldn't help but compare the unbelievably magnificent scenery of New Zealand to the Rockies, and he thoroughly enjoyed swimming off the coast of Australia, then just past entering nationhood. He remembered 1914, when he circumnavigated the world. He visited Kobe, Japan, and experienced the tea ceremony and the country's ritualistic way of life. 
He toured China and Hong Kong, Singapore, Burma, explored India, where he joyfully took his first elephant ride, experienced the Suez Canal, relished Marseille, France, saw Gibraltar and felt the stress of pre-war England. In 1916, he travelled to Cuba, Jamaica, Mexico and many special places throughout the United States, including Yellowstone, the world's first national park. In 1919, he toured throughout California, visited Peru, experienced the Panama Canal, and travelled throughout post-war France and England, where he visited many battlefields and graves. In 1923, John visited Chicago, New York, and other American cities by rail. In 1927, he toured along the west coast of the United States, and in 1928, he travelled by train across Canada and the northern states. For a year, between the summer of 1929 and 1930, John Dean took his longest worldwide trip. He travelled across Canada, visited Sierra Leone, South Africa, Mozambique and Egypt, where he wanted to see and to touch with his own hands the actual stones of the pyramids. And so he did, but was equally astounded at the poverty that surrounded some places. John sent dozens of letters to friends and organizations which reported his observations in a way designed to advance everyone's knowledge. He visited Cyprus, relished the renaissance of Greece, and studied the marvels of Italy, which he described as the land of superfine art, wine and song, of soft beds, puffy short bed comforters, light breakfasts, macaroni, spaghetti, bottles empty and full, and horse blanket towels. He visited Germany. In England he saw the prison where John Bunyan had written one of the books he had grown up with, The Pilgrim's Progress. But John was not nearly done with travelling. Throughout 1932 and 1933 he enjoyed the hotels and the good weather of Los Angeles, the southern states and Mexico. In 1934-35 to 35, he toured through the states, visited Bermuda and South America, in 1936-37, to 37, he enjoyed Miami, explored British Guinea, where he photographed the renowned Kyoteur Falls, and relaxed in Los Angeles. Again, in 1937-38, to 38, he travelled across the states by rail, all the while studying the landscapes and enjoying the atmosphere. When the steamer carrying him along the west coast of North America approached Victoria, his sense of homecoming was fulfilled, at least for the moment. He remembered the spring day in 1884, when he had arrived for the first time, and now he was coming back after what was really only a few years. He was astonished to see how much the city had grown since his first arrival. He was deeply involved in both building and other ventures in Victoria, as well as throughout the province. This gave him the excuse he needed to exercise his love of going places, as long as he was sure of coming home. John recalled his thirty-sixth year. In 1887 he had travelled by train to Calgary, Winnipeg, and south to St. Paul, and had returned to Victoria via Portland and Spokane, he remembered recording his observations about the landscape and the economic potential, and wondered if someone would find them of interest. In 1915, John Dean boarded a vessel near Duncan and travelled up the breathtakingly beautiful coast of British Columbia, all the way to Alaska. It was when John was in Skidigat on Queen Charlotte Islands that Anish told him of the spiritual importance of the area. Anish became serious. The Haida have always regarded the air, land, and water as sacred, he told John. While in Skagway, he observed and photographed the simultaneous setting and rising of the sun.
From their inception until the advent of diesel engines, the railways of the world depended on water to create the steam needed to drive the massive locomotives, and the rails that linked Canada together, the Grand Trunk Railway and later the Canadian National Railway, were no exception. One of the CPR's builders, then working out of Yale, B.C., engaged John to construct enormous water tanks throughout the extremely difficult terrain of the Yale and Kamloops districts. It was a job of great importance, which had to be done properly, since weather tended to make mischief with the connections between the towers and the trains, especially in winter. During his many train trips across the province, the sight of his handiwork filled John with the deep satisfaction of a job well done. His journeys took him across the country. He relished the vast rocky mountains, prairies and great lakes, experiencing the scenery, brilliant colours, the northern lights, the oceans, the towns and the cultures. What he saw left a lasting and favourable impression. From the lower mainland of British Columbia, he did what modern progress in travel arrangements has now made impossible. He took a CPR ferry, which in his day travelled at night, from downtown Vancouver to downtown Victoria, taking eight pleasant hours to complete the trip. This was a full circle back to the spot where he had first arrived, decades previously, and the memory triggered off the scene of his first arrival in Victoria. His ship from San Francisco had steamed around Cape Flattery, past the Race Rocks Lighthouse, around Laurel Point, and docked in Victoria's inner harbour. Victoria looked a lot different in 1884 from what she does now. Rattenbury had not yet worked his magic by installing the Legislative Assembly and the Empress Hotel. What today we call the Inner Harbour back then went over to Blanchard Street. Remnants of the original Fort Victoria were still visible. The main streets went on only so far, unpaved, and in every direction there was manufacturing, farming, markets, and the varied smokes and smells of settlement. The pleasure of being in a new city under British law, and not only watching her grow but being able to help her do so, together with the possibility of new adventures, thrilled John. In that year he was not yet ready to call this place home, but it seemed only the thickness of a shadow away. In any case, this was April. Spring was blending into summer, and everything was in full bloom. From Victoria's beginning, the city had had an atmosphere similar to many small cities in Britain. This had been deliberately created to help ease the feelings of homesickness among Victoria's many British immigrants, an attempt to disguise the fact that their island birthplace was thousands of miles away, and in many minds and hearts this worked. John Dean, however, was enough of a realist to cut through the fallacy. It was the perfect setting for an entrepreneur, and that was what on the surface John Dean was. But there was another, much more central level to the man. He brought wisdom into his daily dealings, which frankly alarmed those whose lives were shallow. Sunday, March the 28th, 1943 John was somewhere between relishing an afternoon snooze in the sun and walking along a city street. He was safe and comfy. he just finished a great lunch and was happily crossing a London street when he saw a street car. Bang! A full body blow which propelled him through the air and bounced him off the pavement. Half stunned, he stood up, feeling half flabbergasted. Mr. Dean, Mr. Dean, are you all right? Sister Mary's face registered great concern, for John's breathing had become laboured. She managed to give him a spoonful of some slightly bitter medicine. 
probably Hawthorne, that eased his discomfort, but he knew his time was coming. Oh, I think I'm ready to give my life over, Anish, he wheezed. That last one hurt so much. Aye, lad, that was what we call the first shock. That was your warning to begin gathering close to you, all those thoughts and memories that are precious to you, and to toss away all the negative fabric for the price of negativity is I. John fell back into an exhausted half-sleep. As he did so, Anish spoke, using his kindest voice. There are still a few things you have to finish, you know, John, before he'll allow you to join us over here, he said positively. Such as... Have a look. He had seen the world. Now he needed to see and realize the countryside atmosphere surrounding his homes. The autumn leaves lay across the mountainside, and the hint of smoke from the farms below reached his nostrils. That, John felt, was one of the loveliest things about November. Fall was a favorite time of the year, striding through the autumn leaves, feeling and experiencing the atmosphere. He smiled while he relished the memory. He loved the time he had spent at Ilahi, the lush of June, the hum of the August forest, the brand new October mists, his oil lanterns, tools, firewood, spring water, the birds, fresh food from the garden, and the best of recorded music. His trails, the timelessness of the valley, his essence, his presence, and his awareness. The fire blazed up, casting light across the familiar, cherished room. As John relived that moment, he was mildly surprised to realize that he'd been involved for half of his life with this amazing place, at the top of the valley, on the mountain, his home. The thought turned to deep pleasure, as, looking into the future, he saw with deep satisfaction a succession of keepers who would follow the reality of his presence, seeing, feeling, and cherishing the wonder for all time. His was a dream that had brought forth a vision that would never die. He had another refuge as well. In 1922, he created Seascape, his home in Esquimalt. It was solidly anchored to a south-facing section of bedrock overlooking Victoria and the Olympic Mountains. It was truly beautiful. He had not only selected the spot, but had also designed the building, supervised its construction, and given precise instructions about such details as the way the windows opened, the design of the panelling, and the placing and character of the rooms. It was complete, and provided a truly elegant space, where for twenty years he read, spent time with his visitors, made his meals, and relished his afternoon naps, an atmosphere of his creation, so desirable, so comfortable, his own home. And because, true Canadian, he'd done this all without having to depend on others, he felt he'd well and truly earned it, which he had. That, he felt, was almost the sovereign of feelings. But there was another one which outranked even that, having visits from all kinds of people, young and old, people who genuinely liked and respected him. He was sure of this because one of his secret delights was to act in ways which tended to get rid of those who he felt lived only on the surface. He carefully staged situations to separate the surface ones from those he felt had earned the right to be called his friends. He'd done this for most of his life. John had developed a deep loathing for pretense of any kind, the utter separation between the nice words and the corrupt actions of the politicians, the double-dealing and graft of the business world, 
all went into his large bag of disgust. He'd built many homes throughout Victoria. He had hunted for gold in Granite Creek near Princeton, British Columbia. He had acted as both a notary public and justice of the peace in places as far apart as Nanaimo and the Caribou had run successfully for public office in Rossland, and during these adventures he had always been able to maintain his values of integrity and honour. Perfect? Of course not, but he had established his standards firmly and, most importantly, had done his best throughout. Here, at the end of his life, he could take it easy, knowing that he had dealt with and treated everyone in the best way. That was a good thing to know. Here in St. Paul's Hospital, almost alone in Vancouver, which he knew was the last place he'd asked his now elderly body to take him to, a comforting thought indeed. Another scene manifested itself, and he allowed his mind to become lost within. Again he remembered his favourite retreat his special cabin on the northwest side of Mount Newton. Ilahi, where he spent a fifth of his time between 1906 and 1939. John recalled one of the many visits from Anish, this one within the wild, mature forest. Anish appeared just as John had looked up the prostrate monarch fir tree, his Majesty, which he'd named after King Edward the Seventh, who had passed away in 1910. Hello, oh, John. Enjoying the summer? Hey there. I was wondering about you. Anish was wearing a flowery suit with a white beret. They were glad to see each other and enjoyed the atmosphere. This mountain has a story, and you'll write its next chapter, said Anish. It's all about how this area will be preserved, including the myths regarding your cabin. Pointing north, he added, and just down there, a duck pond and a gazebo. They listened to the sound of the valley, a hot August afternoon. The air was still and the hum of insects filled the space. They looked upwards in silence. John replied, There's something special about the forest, especially this one. Anish offered, This area will have a name watching for John's reaction. A warm breeze surrounded them, one of the greatest moments John had ever experienced. John relived his last visit there, saw himself looking around, touching the fireplace, stretching those last minutes and finding it hard to let go. As he did so, he knew it was time to go, and the same again happened at Seascape, where he knowingly and wantedly left for Vancouver. He looked across his drawing-room and headed down the entrance stairs. For years he endured an enlarged heart, but he was determined to thumb his nose at death by walking and climbing everywhere he visited. He explored all over southern Vancouver Island, hiked the area hilltops, from which his favourite magnificent peaks of both Mount Baker and Rainier are sometimes visible, and from time to time took the Esquimalt and Nanaimo Railway up to Shawnigan Lake and beyond to visit friends who lived there. He spent several winter holidays at the Harrison Hot Springs, and as he grew older, he travelled throughout the southern United States, staying in nice hotels, eating good food, and relishing the warm, dry weather. Although Dean enjoyed his time away, he loved nothing more than returning home. John's worldwide travels had had at least one major effect. They reinforced his belief that dividing the earth into countries was an outworn ideal of nationalism, an evil which had brought about most of the world's dread. That memory brought him back sharply to his European journey at the end of the Great War. Tears came easily now, for, in his mind, 
He was once again in Flanders, Belgium. The war to end all wars had ended only months ago, and thousands of stark white crosses seemed to go on forever. John Dean stood in command, surrounded by a great crowd of witnesses, knowing of the perseverance, the race. He'd followed the war closely as reported in the newspapers. Because of his many close friendships with young people all over the world, he felt a singular kinship with the youth whose bodies lay beneath. As the scene progressed, he remembered his growing passion. You can bet your sweet life, he thought, that neither the generals nor the politicians on either side lost any one dear to them, and they themselves were probably a long, long way from the actual fighting. It was likely true, and during his visit to the Vimy Ridge War Memorial in France, he had had to put his clamps down to prevent that severity from reaching expression, and his passion nearly burst to the surface when he saw what remained of the ghastly trenches, those stinking holes of misery. His intensity propelled conversation. Oh, John, my boy, you're right about that, Anish whispered, gently stroking his dear old friend's hair. From the human standpoint, there was no need at all for that confrontation, or for the one that's going on right now, nor for any other war, except to feed the massive egos of the military and political types in charge, and the blindness of the people behind them. John asked with exhaustion and dismay, What is the point? Lad, you and I know each other well, so I will tell you a very essential thing. Even now, as millions more follow in the footsteps of those who lie there and elsewhere in the world, you need to realize that there is a God, that He has a plan, and for the years coming, the peoples of the world will be living in the most crucial period in all of human history. You need to recognize that there is a correction, a divine rationale that is cleansing the human race of former attitudes by means of these terrible events, attitudes which have held us back from destiny. And that purpose is guiding humanity towards a world with neither poverty nor disease, and where there is no need for war. But I won't live to experience this, will I? Not in this world you won't. Then Anish made the most surprising statement John had ever heard. Descendants of the people you have known will live to see this happen. I can promise you that. There was a long silence while John digested the future. Then, do you think it will be any better than the miserable mess that we're experiencing now? Oh, John, life will be much, much better, light years beyond your fertile imagination, without a doubt. John received this with deep satisfaction, and was able to relax more deeply. Sister Mary returned with an afternoon hot milk and toast, and asked him if he were comfortable. "'About as well as I can expect,' he said. Then, apropos of nothing, he added, "'Do you know, sister, I designed my own tombstone years ago.' The nun was deeply startled by this. "'I... I don't know what to say,' she exclaimed. Why, I've never heard of anyone doing such a thing. Sister, said John with a wry smile, I've always known that some day I would die. We all will, you know. So I decided a long time ago to beat death at one thing. I will at least be ready. And he laughed so infectiously that she couldn't help but join in the merriment. Anish 
Sister Mary, and John enjoyed the moment. Rising up. Oh, I feel so good. I feel refreshed. I feel young and ready. Please, Anish, give me a hand. Anish, laughing, gave John a hand, first to sit up and then to stand free of the bed he had died on. Well, that was easy enough, said John. He realised that he was free and felt well rewarded. Turn around, my friend, and have a look at what you've left behind. John did, and was surprised when he saw the reality of what he'd just stepped out of. Oh, yes, no wonder. Now what's going to happen? Oh, how fantastic! Light, brighter than the sun, begun to surround them. Shapes, indistinct at first, but then with a clarity that would have blinded him, began to manifest themselves. For a timeless time he felt that he didn't know them, but then, more like someone who needed to be reminded, he recognised who they were. Mother, Dad, Sarah, George, Uncle Nathan, Uncle John. These were the ones in the foreground. Dozens of others were joining them every moment, and they were so glad to see him. I, I, do I know these people? You do in a way. These are the people you met throughout your life who were influenced by your character. You may not have noticed, but they recognized the good in you and grew from that experience. Brighter and stronger than anything else was the love and the music. But there was one thing he knew he had to have a look at before seeing anything else. His home within a small mountain, Claywill Nook. Yes, Spot on, John, a true name. A place of refuge, Clare Will Nook, describes the mountain's true meaning. The first people have been in touch with the spiritual reality, now see the reality of what you created. And there she was, not only a small log cabin in the wild forest, but now there were Beautiful gardens separated by exquisite stone walls and staircases, trees bearing the most beautiful coloured fruits of all shapes and sizes, orange, ruby red, emerald green, royal blue, purple and brilliant yellow. Their perfumes melded one with another, and a wonderful melody surrounded them and nestled within this heavenly mountain valley paradise was the reality underlying the cabin, changed now into what he felt was, for what had been his cabin was now a holy place, snow white with jeweled windows and gold trims, surrounded by an amazing emerald green landscape. But the most astounding thing was that when he took a couple of cautious steps inside, it proved to be much larger than anticipated. There were fantastic gardens inside the space, complementing the formal gardens outside, where, in the original cabin, he had had his cherished books. There now stood a library, and not only did every book seem without limits, each one was a new discovery. The author was there too.